this second part I'm going to cover the vitreous cavity normally in the young age the vitreous cavity is clear with no echoes while getting old there is normally a low reflectability in the vitreous and sometimes we have a posterior vitreous detachment which is mobile so if you notice here we get posterior vitreous detachment and if you see the echo here compared to the 100% it's much lower than the 100% here we get the 0% and here this is the 100% e either the initial reflection or the sclerar wall on the B scan you can tell that this line is not that bright as the background here so we get the same impression that this reflection is not that high as we can see it here. Sometimes if there is some blood on the posterior vitreous detachment, then the posterior vitreous will be more demarcated and the reflection will be more and more if you compare this lower part with the upper part. Normally we have points of attachment between the vitreous and wall. These are at the disc area, at the vitreous base, along the blood vessels or in areas of neovascularization, following a site of perforation to the walls. We notice that if there is attachment between the posterior vitreous attachment and the optic disc, this attachment is eccentric. It's not in the middle of the disc. This is important to separate between retinal detachment where the membrane is centered to the disc and posterior vitreous detachment still attached to the disc where the membrane is in eccentric position. You notice here the difference between this membrane eccentrically attached and this membrane attached to the center. Sometimes we can see on the posterior vitreous detachment condensations here representing this bias ring. Here we get the optic nerve, this is a muscle. We have a membrane here in the vitreous cavity. You can see here this membrane is still attached to the disc and it is on an eccentric location. Notice the movement, the after movement of the vitreous. And this is another example. This is the choroidal retina. This is a muscle. You notice the movement, the after movement of the vitreous. One important thing, if you have a membrane attached to the disc and you are not sure it is a retina detached or is it a posterior vitreous detachment, is that you make different sections starting toward the disc and gradually make more sections toward the porous serrata. If it's a retina 
All the time, the retina is thick and the amplitude of this membrane is high, quite high, similar to the wall. While in case of osseovitreal detachment, in the central part, the peak is high, and gradually as we go toward the vitreous base, the peak is less. Sometimes we see dots in the vitreous cavity. They can be due to RBCs or infection with cells or asteroid hyalosis. We notice all these are of the same patient but with different gains. The ultrasound gain here is 85, 84, 81, 79, 77. You notice the vitreous cavity when the gain is high, we can see much, much better than the gain is low. That's why if you are looking for dots in the vitreous cavity, you have to increase the gain. Hemorrhage, if it's a fresh hemorrhage, it will be like dots in the cavity in the scan, while if it's an organized hemorrhage, then it will be in the form of membranes. You can see the difference between these fine dots here and this condensed hyperrefractive membrane compared to what the situation was in here. In this example, the vitreous cavity is filled here with fine dots. The posterior vitreous cavity we can see it's filled with these fine dots and with the movement of the eye you can see the movement of the vitreous gel filled with these dots in this example again the vitreous cavity is filled with dots There is possible vitreous detachment. There is hyperreflective force, this is denoting areas with membranes in the cavity. And you notice even in the vitreous cavity, there are areas without dots. Sometimes we have a vit posterior vitreous detachment and the hemorrhage is subhyaloid, or sometimes it can find its way in the canal of cloquet. Here we get the posseovitreal detachment with subhyaloid hemorrhage, and here hemorrhage finds its way into the canal of cloquet. The character of the subhyaloid hemorrhage is that it does not clot, it remains of low reflectability, mobile, even if it's long standing. In contrast to the hemorrhage inside the vitreous, that it clots and becomes hyperrefractive. If the vitreous cavity is filled with cells, then we get something similar to what we have seen in case of hemorrhage. But the difference here is the history, and then if we see the choroid, it is thickened. Again, cells, so many cells in the cavity, and a thickened choroid. So a thickened choroid will help us to differentiate between hemorrhage and cells. If there is infection, we are expecting that the choroid is thicker. Together with the history, this will help us to differentiate between dots due to hemorrhage and dots due to infection. The last thing is asteroid hyalosis, where we have calcium deposited in the vitreous cavity. As you notice here, the reflectability is high. And a second character is that the most peripheral part of the vitreous is free of these calcium dots. So here we have a posterior vitreous detachment. This is the peripheral part of the vitreous. It is of low reflectability compared to the area where we have the calcium. 
a silicon filled eye that's a difference of appearance silicon delays the speed of passage of sound so that's why the eye will appear quite long here this is 10 20 30 34 millimeters length of the eye this is an artifact because an IOL is here and this is the hyper reflectability of the of the silicon that we see at the back surface again this is the silicon this is the wall and we can see some reflections here this denotes incomplete filling of the vitreous cavity we have some area not filled with the silicon This is the incomplete fill of the eye with silicon. You notice the hyperreflective back surface of the silicon. You notice here choroid and retina, and this is the sclera. 